Okay, good evening, everyone. At this time, I'd like to call to order the um, regular meeting of the Nilani Mauka, Launani Valley Neighborhood Board 35 <clears throat> to order. Uh, this is June 20th at 7 p.m. This time, I'd like to ask Scout DSA Troop 664 for a presentation of our colors and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, please rise for the presentation of the board. Group attention, call our attention, call that board march. Our time march. Our PO march. And oh, please join me in the flood of the winter. Scouts of America. Wait. Uh, United States of America. Salute the public, which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and justice for all. Mark up. Mark time. March. All right, we all march. Forward march. You may be seated. Thank you, Troop 664. We're really blessed to have you here every month. Open our meetings. Uh, moving on to our meeting agenda, meeting the quorum, Vice Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Chair Hazama and your Mililani Malka and Laonani Neighborhood Board, in terms of meeting the quorum, we just ask, uh, again, we value all the feedback, ideas, uh, issues that you raise uh, as a community, but we just ask if you would please raise your hand uh, and then recognized uh, by the chair, then please come up that are present here, come up to the microphone uh, for those joining us virtually. Uh, again, please just uh, raise your hand or use the icon to get the attention of the ch uh, chair. And then when recognized by the chair, again, um, please state uh, your concern. Uh, we ask also finally that you limit it to about three minutes if you could, so that we could hear from everyone in the community uh, who would like to share. Okay, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. This is Hello. Okay, thank you, Vice Chair. Moving on to our monthly reports, the Honolulu Fire Department. I believe it's online. Hello, hi everyone. I'm Firefighter Klingon. I'm with the Honolulu Fire Department, uh, the Mililani Malka Station, and I have the May 2023 uh, statistics. Uh, during May 2023, we responded to one structure fire, one wildland brush fire, one cooking fire, uh, one activated alarm with no fire present, uh, 35 calls for medical assistance, uh, one motor vehicle crash uh, with a collision, uh, zero uh, collisions involving pedestrians, one mountain rescue, uh, zero ocean rescues, and zero hazardous materials incidents. Um, our fire safety tip for this month is uh, in Hawaii, wildland fire season is all year long due to our constantly warm climate. You can make a difference to prevent the threat of a wild fire damaging your island, our island homes. Uh, protect your home by reducing fuels is a possibility of ignition. Maintain your yard, clean out your gutters and dispose of clutter regularly. Uh, Xeriscape yards are easiest to maintain and safest against wild fires. Exercise extreme caution when utilizing flame producing devices such as matches and lighters. Grills, fire cracker, crackers, uh, even the smallest spark, spark or flame. Uh, can ignite dry wildland vegetation. Uh, flame producing devices should be kept away from young children and always follow the manufacturer's directions on the label. 
If you see something, say something. If you see smoke, don't stall, call 911. Your quick response can save homes and more importantly, save lives. The earlier we could get to a fire, the better chance we can pre prevent it from spreading. Uh, that's all we have for this month. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Any questions for the Honolulu Fire Department? The audience? No, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good evening. Two. Uh, moving on to the Honolulu Police Department. Good evening, Chair. Good evening, board members, and good evening, community members. My name is Tim Minuma. I'm the representative for the Honolulu Police Department. And today, I just want to start off with our our stats for this month. So we are seeing an increase in burglaries and car break-ins in our district, especially in the Milani area. And unfortunately, though, with a lot of our vehicles, it's always just, most of them, especially in the Milani, are open door and we and these we call it unauthorized entry to motor vehicle. So we do encourage all of you, especially if you know your neighbors, just remind them to lock the doors. If you are the ones that, that unlock, we encourage you to lock the doors as well. Yes, we live in a safe, beautiful city, Milani, but then we can't be complacent. Fortunately, we do have crime like any other city out there. As for burglaries, we are seeing a trend in um, the, bur the burglaries happening during evening hours between 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. And they're, the suspects in these cases are usually targeting homes with jealousy windows. We are currently investigating all of them, but we just want to, we encourage our community members, if you do have jealousies, please glue them. If you know any Kapunans that have jealousies, please reach out and try to help them out. And if you want to know what's, if you want to see where those crime trends are happening, please look at our crimes, uh, honolulupd.org, our crime map. And from there, you can see where all the burglaries are taking place. A lot of them are taking place in the lower middle line area. And that's what I have. Is there any questions? Thank you. Any questions for the Honolulu Police Department? Yeah. That's, that's, that's not. Um, it, it's a weird crux because it's not in Milan Malga or Laonani. It's actually um, YPO Gentry, but and I will address it with um, House Member Okimoto later too. But going into the grave, the, into the cemetery, that road that leads up yeah. to the prison, so that main road, that's Kamehameha Highway as far as the listings on that. It's actually Kamehameha Highway, which is why the address for those areas to come in the highway. I'm concerned because there's illegal bending going on down that whole strip. It's not just the one that's closest to the prison road. They come all the way to the top, such as Mother's Day and Father's Day. It took over an hour to get out because cars were swerving around because they're actually in the road. Um, when we called HPD, we were told, well, there's no sign, so they can't do anything. Is that something that police can be, it's coming my highway. If I were yeah. by core, you know, in front of McDonald's or something or Okinawa Center on coming my highway, I'm pretty sure I would be told I can't be there without yeah. a sign. Huh? So, okay, so I, I have an idea where you're talking about the cemetery going right, the intersection, you, you know, by Costco, Costco going straight. Yeah. So from my knowledge over there, yes, I do see uh, there's flowers, right? There's people sending plants, flowers. So from my knowledge, I do believe that the city does have a ordinance where, uh, Anyone selling flowers, fresh, was it fresh, fresh fruits, flowers, and I don't know if anyone over six years old can sell products. Uh, but I, I don't know if they need a permit. But what I'll, do, I'll follow up and I'll follow up with our uh, district three community policing team and try to see what they what they have done, and from there I can try get to try get you that results. Okay, because yeah, I was looking at the statutes, and you can do that outside the three foot firm that's technically considered part of the street. Mm -hmm. You can do that behind that, like in the bush or something, but they're literally in the roadway. So that's why cars have to go around and everybody got stuck. Okay. So, yeah. It was just and it's so unsafe because people just dart out of their car. Okay. No, yeah, I'll let the, our partners in the district read the Pro City YPO guys let I'll let them know. Hey, thank you. Any other questions for the police department? Anyone online? Thank you. All right, thank you. And moving on to Board of Water Supply, Kathleen. Aloha. Thank you, Chair, Board members. Nice to see everybody. I'm happy to report no main breaks in your community this past month. And everyone should have recently received their water quality report. This water quality report is mandated uh, by federal and state uh, law. 
and it goes out every June to everybody who is a customer of ours to let you know that your water is safe and the kinds of tests and things that we've been running. Uh, that's pretty much my report. Any questions? Any questions for Board of Water Supply this evening? Yes, I have some. Hmm? Kathleen? Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you? Good. I love your background there. Um, oh, thank question. you. <laughs> Here's a question from last month concerning a complaint from a, a resident concerning the uh, board of water supply a pumping house up here. Um, there was some some construction. Oh that yes, a yes. Years ago. Oh gosh, uh, yes. We actually huh? took care of it. Uh, we uh, looked into it, and the and the area he was concerned about with the trees not being trimmed and stuff that actually belongs to the association. So apparently, it did get trimmed. Uh, and we uh, addressed his concerns and he was satisfied. So thank you for that. Thank you. I live up here also. So I drove by to check and it just appears mm -hmm. that the contractor is busy doing their work. They may leave just leave things out. There's equipment. Okay. There's a number of equipment items that are out there, some barrels. And so I um, appreciate all the Board of Water Supply is, is helping to do to um, help it look more ship shape. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Hey, any other questions for board of water supply? Seeking? All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, military rep, Colonel. Good evening. Uh, good evening, chair, everybody. Lieutenant Colonel Dan Ancelis with the 130th engineer brigade based out of Schofield barracks. Uh, for July, the job fair, the U S army garrison in Hawaii is holding its next hiring fair on 25 July at Kapolei high school, beginning at 8 30 AM and ending at 2 30 PM. This is open to the public. There will be job officers provisional hiring the day of the job fair. Advanced applicants may go to www.himwr.com. Click on the employment banner to learn of openings and how to apply online. Walk-ins are welcome and should bring, bring two forms of references, proof of ID, social security card, resume, or application. There are opportunities in business operations like golf, bowling, food service, and many more. The Child Youth Services or CYS will have openings to consider. For those who work in CYS, there are a variety of benefits such as retirement, access to all recreational facilities, discounted child care training, and commissary and PX privileges. If you are interested in working with children, we have a position for you. Come on out and see what's available. Available employment opportunities will wait. Uh, for the summer, um, as in typical any military movement season, the summer is a high volume uh, season for new soldiers that will be coming to the island. So we want to thank the community up front for all the support for both them and their families uh, to the island. Uh, the Army is gearing up for its annual 4th of July weekend in the open house at Schofield Barracks. This year's event will be held on 1 July Saturday. The event is open to the public and we'll, we encourage the public to come visit for the day and enjoy the varieties of venues for KP and adults. Plain White Tees and L King are named artists and the Army's premier parachute demonstration team, the Golden Knights, will perform and this event is course free. The garrison uh, for next month or in the coming months, the garrison is actually requesting to get onto the neighborhood gold calendar, specifically to provide the aviation brief by the US Army and Marine Corps. Now they're looking for about 15 to 20 minutes to provide a presentation and allow for any questions. So it's all work with Dylan where we can get that in the, the coming months. And then finally, if you have any aviation complaints, reminders to call 808-656-3487 or 3159 to provide time, location, types of aircraft, and if possible, take a photo and email them to Hawaii uh, U.S. Army Garrison Block. Subject to anybody's questions. Thank you, Colonel. Any questions for the military team? Anyone online? Thank you, Colonel. I thank Appreciate you. it. And moving on to board business, we have Hawaii's Alliance for Progression Action, Fern Holland. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much uh -huh. for having me. Um, am I able to share screen? Yes. So, oh, shucks. Um, let's see if this works. Oh, I don't think it's going to let me do it. It's going to make me. Hold on. It's going to make me leave the meeting to show this. I'm not familiar with. Hmm. Hi, Fern. Um, 
you see the share screen button um, at the bottom of your screen on WebEx? I do. I think it's going to make me quit and redo it because I've never used WebEx before. So it's saying quit. So should I just come right back or should I just present some of the information? When, uh, when you click on the share button, um, you're saying the first thing that pops up is quit. It makes me open system preferences and access it. And then it says quit and reopen. Would okay. you like me to try that? Uh, could you email it to me and then I can open it and share screen for you? I believe I did email it to you prior. Let me uh, it check. should have sent you access a couple hours ago. All right, let me check right now. Awesome. Thank you so much. I actually tabbed through this pretty quick. Um, so should I just say next <laughs> as we go? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you all very much. I'm going to move through this presentation pretty quickly. It's generally about a half hour or 45 minutes, um, but I've shortened it down to just give you guys the gist of what we're doing. And then if anybody's interested or would like more information, I'd be happy to meet and go into it in more detail. Um, next slide, please. We are basically, I don't. Yeah, just a heads up. I think when I did this in the past, it's very slow to. Oh, change. really? Okay. Oh, just know that I hear you. Okay. Sorry about that. Check this out. Okay. Okay. So basically, today we're talking about um, the use of restricted use pesticides um, in the community. And this is something I've been working on for about 15 years now. Um, these are pesticides that are not available over the counter. Um, they need a special certification to apply them. Um, they vary from state to state, depending on what states uh, register what pesticides as restricted use. Um, and they generally have significant impact to the health and environment. And you can go to the next slide, Dylan. Uh, these pesticides are, you know, part of the problem that we've had in this in, in the United States in general, actually, is the failure to protect public interest from pesticides um, throughout history. We've failed really to implement the precautionary principle and instead uh, we tend to wait for a burden of proof. Uh, so rather than saying we should be on the precautionary side, we tend to wait until there's enough evidence that there's undeniable harm before we generally take action. And that's why we have seen this failure to really protect um, public interest. Next slide. Um, this effort to receive the data that we're talking about today has been a really long process. Uh, we've actually been fighting for the disclosure data for about 10 years now. Um, I was involved in some of the local stuff on the Kauai County um, level and statewide over the last few years. Um, finally, in 2018, we passed a statewide bill that started to collect this data and make it available. Next slide. Um, and what we've learned from the 2019 data, which was the first round of data that became available um, just a couple of years ago, once we crunched all these numbers, it looks like the top 10 users of all restricted use pesticides throughout all of the islands um, account for about 99% of the reported use. Um, so really only about 10 users are using the bulk of these restricted use pesticides. And of those, um, about five out of them are growing food for actual human consumption, including um, pineapples. Next slide. I want to just say that this data has a lot of caveats and a lot of concerns, um, and we're still fighting for better data um, reporting because there's a lot of things um, to consider. First of all, in this data, we're only looking at the active ingredients that were applied. Uh, we're not talking about the inert ingredients. Um, there's a lot of regulatory loopholes that prevent some of this stuff from being reported. Um, there's a lot of limitations in how the data was presented. Um, and there's also uh, concerns with combinations that have never been studied. And so a lot of this is really just looking um, individually at active ingredients. Um, and it's very important to mention that correlation does not equal causation. And so even though we see some correlation in certain areas of concern, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the cause of anything. Next slide. What we've learned is very concerning after looking at the, all of this data statewide, um, what became immediately of the highest concern about exposure to pretty toxic restricted use pesticides would be the north central corridor of Oahu. 
Um, it was, you know, pretty surprising to us that there was actually over 216,000 pounds reported um, in 2019 alone as utilized um, just in this north central area. And we basically split the central corridor of Oahu into two sections, um, north of Schofield Barracks and south. Um, north of it being the North Central Corridor is where we found these 23 different restricted use pesticides um, used in combination, equaling over 108 tons um, just in that one year of 2019. Next slide. Uh, what we learned is that the major users um, in the area were the larger plantations, Sugarland Farms um, and Aloon Farms, as well as um, the chemical corporations, Monsanto, which is now Bayer, uh, Pioneer Corteva as well as Hartung. Next. Particularly of concern um, on the Dole Plantation is the use of a highly toxic fumigant called 1,3-D, um, but particularly the close proximity to Whitmore Village, uh, Wahiwa, and Waialua, um, where the bulk of these pesticides are being used, um, is very concerning, especially when you're talking about drift of these highly toxic and mobile fumigants. Next slide. Particularly, again, the close proximity and less than a mile to Whitmore Village. Uh, when you start to add the red there, the, that's dark red in the middle is the Dole Plantation. And then the outer parcels that are brighter red are the Sugarland parcels. Um, Sugarland Farms, in conjunction with Dole collectively in that whole area, uses a lot of pesticides in really close proximity to those communities, um, particularly the barracks, uh, Wahiwa and Whitmore Village. Next slide. Particularly of concern is the 1,3-D um, telone, the use of uh, basically this very toxic fumigant. The bulk of these chemicals used on this particular parcel um, by Dole was really this fumigant. It was over 177,000 pounds of active ingredient that was used in 2019 alone, as well as other pesticides. And I don't really have the time to go into any much more of that, but next slide. And then we saw with Sugarland Farms that they added another 30,000 pounds of metam sodium, which is another fumigant, as well as, you know, many other pesticides. I believe over 15 other pesticides were used um, just on those parcels, but particularly of concern, again, that fumigant, a different fumigant called metam sodium. So in conjunction with this 30,000, there was the 177,000 pounds of the 1,3-D that was all used in this one particular area. Next slide. And then we looked at the South corridor um, and particularly that's everything below Whitmore village. Um, and we see a corridor throughout the central Oahu coast, all the way down to Eva, where you see restricted use pesticides being applied. Um, about 72,000 pounds collectively were also applied in the su Southern, what we're calling the Southern corridor section. And of those were 23 different pesticide formulations. Next slide. We found that of that southern corridor, 96% of that was utilized by Sugarland Farms. Um, in, in fact, about 70,000 of the pounds um, that are applied were applied by Sugarland Farms, and 67,000 pounds of that was this toxic uh, fumigant, metam sodium. Next slide. Particularly of concern is that the bulk of this application is happening on this parcel adjacent. Um, across from Mililani Town um, near YPO Acres. And so if you just go next slide again for me, it'll show you the detail of the areas of concern, particularly um, the very close proximity to Mililani Town. Again, Wahiwa being kind of in the middle of these two heavily uh, fumigated areas. Next slide. Again, in this area, we see metam sodium. So on both sides of um, Whitmore Village, there's this heavy use of fumigant, uh, of particularly metam sodium, as well as other pesticides. Next slide. Collectively on Oahu, we found that in 2019 alone, um, there was close to um, 289,000 pounds, uh, nearly 145 tons of restricted use pesticides. You know, shocking really in number, um, possibly one of the most heavily sprayed per acre per pound areas in the United States, uh, particularly of concern, again, those two fumigants. And 99% of all use on Oahu happened between Waialua and Eva. Next slide. Particularly of concern with this is the combination of pesticides. Pesticides have never been studied in combination. So we really have no idea the unknown, both the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns of mixing these types of pesticides and the way that they interact. Next slide. 
But we also know um, through you know decades of research that a lot of these pesticides are associated to many different health impacts, uh, reproductive impacts, um, cancer, uh, headaches, nausea, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, respiratory impacts, Parkinson's disease, particularly uh, related to paraquat, as well as organ damage. And then there's environmental concerns um, to pollinators, to aquatic life, and to groundwater contamination. Next slide. So currently, we don't really have adequate protections in Hawaii, and for many years, we've been fighting to get better protections. Uh, we do have a 100-foot buffer zone around schools. Right now, during school hours, um, California has a quarter of a mile around schools. Um, there are different requirements per each label. Each pesticide has various requirements, but there's really not enough protection in Hawaii, um, especially given the fact that we have such extensive experimental field trials, uh, which often don't fall under the same protections as many other things would. Next slide. <clears throat> Currently, our next steps is that we're mapping the 2020 to 2022 data to try to get a better idea of what's been happening over the last four years, because we're only reporting back on the 2019 data. We're fighting for better reporting because it took years to make the data usable and mappable um, and you know user friendly, so to speak. Uh, we're looking at trying to do better soil and water sampling and work with other partners to try to get a better idea of what's residual in the environment. Uh, we're doing more community meetings like this and outreach to try to better understand how we can serve the community. And we're fighting for buffer zones and protections. Next slide. Now uh, you can follow us and stay in touch uh, via email or through our alerts and um, mail list or through social media um, and engage. If you'd like to be involved in this issue um, in your community, you can reach out and in during the legislative session, we also do ask for testimony and engagement to try to help to get these pesticide uh, legislative measures that we've been working on for years um, traction basically in the house. Um, so you could tell your friends and organize future meetings. I'd be happy to come and share in more detail. Next slide. That's it. And then, yeah, our details here. Um, I work with Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. So that's hapahai.org. And then if you go to the next slide, it has my email and that would be everything from me. Thank you all so much. Sorry, it took a little longer. Oh, thank you very much for an, any questions uh, for Papa Stephen. Hi, I wanted to um, see if you folks have reached out to ADC and the programs that are coming out under Agribusiness Development Corporation, because all of that land that the state purchased over the last so many years are situated right in between the dirtiest farms going out towards the North Shore. Is that something that you folks are working legislatively with those there? Um, because they moved from the Department of Agriculture, they're now with DBED. So that's, you know, are you folks doing anything with that? Over the last few years, thank you for the question, by the way. Uh, over the last few years, we have been fighting for better um, ADC reform overall. We've been fighting to try to get the focus of ADC to produce food, to sustain sustain regenerative farms. Um, and we, we've been working on and, and tried to work on legislative measures to reform the ADC in a way that didn't just transfer it to DBET. Unfortunately, it did uh, get transferred to DBET and you know we continue the outreach, but uh, we haven't had great success in working directly with the ADC, um, but we are continuing to push for better reform of the ADC and the better management of state lands in general for the betterment of the public good um, and protection. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, go ahead, Representative. Oh, oh Representative Peruso? Oh, no, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank them for the presentation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Fern. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have discussion regarding a resolution uh, regarding the city council pay raises. Mr. Chairman and neighborhood board members, uh, I have been honchoing this issue since March. I would make a lot of make a lot of noise about a lot of stuff, but I think let's get down to the issue. Um, Based on some of the advertiser um, um, 
uh, conversations in the uh, paper. I also watched the Alelo for approximately eight hours. I listened to a lot of testimony. I listened to a lot of things. One of the things that I found in the information that was interesting was according to salary commission, whatever it was, said that the city council had not had a raise in 20 years. The second part of that is the salary commission itself. Back to the 20 year lack of raises. I cannot speak to that. I do not know why nothing happened. Trying to catch up is a bad idea. Also, the salary commission is appointed by the city council. Based on a lot of the information and stuff that's been going on in our legislature, planning commission or planning department and other departments that have been investigated as well as union, I venture to say that the salary commission should not be presented by the city council. It should be presented by outside people in business, etc. There should be some other way. I am totally against, and we do represent people of this community. I do absolutely resent a 64% Increase, particularly when the salary commission's first proposal was 150%, and they decided to back it down to 64. I'm not sure that that makes a lot of difference. I'm also not sure that the public has been hurt because on Alelo, the city council meeting took place, whatever you might see it was, and it was populated by many citizens. It was populated by Zoom people. I don't even know how many people were there because I was in and out. What I did hear and what I thought was probably there were two compelling speakers. One at the end in Olelo that was at the end of the meeting, close to the end of the meeting. The lady stood up. She had been patiently sitting in the back as I had been watching her. And she stated that she had taken off work of her two jobs that day. And she was out $300, which she needed to pay bill. And yet, she came down to testify. I thought the city council handled it poorly. There should have been a special meeting on just that issue alone, instead of the whole city council agenda, which I didn't sit all the way through. I think the whole thing was handled badly. I requested in March, after seeing resolutions from Kaimaki, Pololo, I believe there's a number of other neighborhood boards that have done resolutions. And none of them are in favor of this 64%. I do know that there are people in this community who are suffering very large property tax increases. I think this issue needs to go back to the drawing board. As I said, I cannot account for 20 years of raises. Normal raises are 5% of 5, 10% five, depending on you know, the business. I cannot account for 20 years, but I cannot account for 64%. Can't get, get my head around it. And I've had calls, as all of us probably have. I would therefore, if it's in order, Chair, I would like to put the new resolution that Dylan has prepared for us as of 5.22.2023. I would like to put it up for motion to have this resolution again. So moved to have a second. The resolution. We need a second. A second. Okay, second by Teresa. Moved and seconded. We're on discussion. 
any discussion from the audience or from the board members? Anybody online? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would echo back what had uh, Alice had mentioned about visibility. Um, from the commission level, I had several chairs contact me concerning it. And from the commission level, we we're just in, uh, would like to see a dialogue. So our position was in favor of a meeting, a public forum, if you will, go ahead and bring this before the public and then air out any grievances that may happen and allow the, uh, the city council to speak concerning it. But it has been an issue with several of the chairs also. So I would agree with Alice as far as the uh, opening up a dialogue with the public. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Chair, sure, just a point of clarification, even whether the outcome of this resolution from this board, it's still going to pass anyhow, right? Well, um, due to timing and the fact that we are bound by Sunshine Law, um, understand the council deadline to agenda a meeting has passed. Um, in order to meet the one July um, deadline. However, you know, I think it's both in the board can go on record. Your position. So you're correct, that's true. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to get this in that. Yeah. My only comment is, you know, I see a lot of things and I don't know what the council chairs Objection is to holding or, or having a meeting. So apparently, he's the one that makes the final decision. Um, but the fact that the issue about whether council members should be working full time or have or have other jobs, um, I find it very interesting that the council's position, or maybe the chair's position, is that he will put that before the voters when he doesn't want to put the period before the voters. So it's kind of a little bit about putting the cart before the horse a little bit because you know, there is no guarantee that the charter amendment will pass. He wants the people to vote for it, and it's possible that the charter amendment may not pass. In which case, now we have the council members that now are going to be paid the raises, but then are now still eligible to to work other jobs at the same time. So, um, I think the process needs to really be looked at. Starting with future for future councils. Um, the fact that the council has basically to accept, if they would take no action to accept the ratings, and it should be reversed, that they should take action to accept them or something like that. But that is a, I guess, an interesting topic, and it puts the council members, I think, in a bad situation in which they get to vote for their own theory. I get a meet with. Uh, but again, that's I think that's something that needs to be looked at by I mean, the council for the future charter amendment to change that process. But it doesn't put them in that situation. And you know, maybe I don't think all of them are opposed to having a public hearing, public meeting, no public input on that. Uh, but it's just the way the current charter reads and the charter's other needs to be changed. Um, Chair. Yeah, go ahead. I guess for myself, I'd like to hear more so hear from the council members within my district. I've only heard one very vehemently say we shouldn't have these reasons. I was not comfortable with it. I even spoke to about it a private function that we were at together and there was an additional council member who was also initially you know not for it it's not what we want but what about all the rest i know chair was chairs couldn't get things done but i feel like i haven't heard anything from any of the representation for our district or other district at some point that, that that's really what i'd like to know where were they and in, in, in their thought process of Yay or nay on where they stood with this, especially knowing that you know some of some of them have other jobs or they have other city positions. Um, 
and they work. I'm not. Please know, I know a lot of them work full, work full time. They're going between so many different districts now because of the redistricting. They put in the time, their staff puts in the time and energy. I just feel like it would be nice to know how they felt about the US, this position they were put in to vote for their own raises and the amount. Knowing that there are so many families struggling to work two or three jobs, they don't get to see kids, things of that nature. Can't help it. The commission said, yay. It is what it is, but I would like to know what our council members felt about. Okay, you like to know before the vote or after the vote? Okay, yeah, come up to the mic. Otherwise, they can't hear you on the. Evening, everyone. The neighborhood board of council. Uh, I'm on Maui, Kizong. I'm a resident. Milani Maui, my wife and I, Susan. Um, of course, uh, uh, paid attention to the Alex's initial comments on the subject that we're discussing now, and both of the chair and the vice chair's comments. I think myself with uh, a lot of uh, the residents from the community, well, the state, and the city council, and the agents of uh, that we're discussing right now. I think we've all made a lot of attention. Most, if not all of us, myself, here, and trying to tune in as much as possible all the details that have been told up right now. A couple of things I just kind of wanted to share that we kind of follow as quickly as possible, especially uh, with respect to our neighborhood board meeting tonight. I think that was the main point here. Chair and Vice Chair, where we're trying to go with this point record uh, in terms of uh, the discussion, issues, concerns of the pay rates that we hold by the council. Having said that, I, I've tried my best on a study into it. I, I heard a lot of different uh, opinions, discussions, topics, friends, family, and and it differs along the lines. Being personal, I, as much as I've been able to kind of dig into it, I've seen merits on both sides of whether I'm dialed into the enough or not. Merits on all the political rates and merits on concerns on the pay rates. If there's uh, anything that I can kind of maybe share a little bit on concern and where neighborhood can go from here, it, it probably lies solely in what I think we've already talked about, the possibility of more dialogue in the community and the residents on trying to find out what has has on into this process. Whether we can get at that stage or not, I'm honestly not sure. But my point uh, behind the microphone right now is technology, but little much do I understand. And again, just kind of going back to a point where I see merits, see merits and concerns about it and the desire, I guess, you know, discussion from the public, whether our neighborhood board maybe can go on record to affect that, I'm not sure, but I guess I got to round it out where, where I am as a citizen and a resident. Uh, if, if there's more opportunity to discuss it, I'm sure that would be a great opportunity. But as far as the timelines, especially with the specific processes, I'm not sure if we have the opportunity or not. And, and if not, then 
process continues, but if there is an opportunity, we'll probably discuss it more for them to get across. I wanted to share that point and hopefully process however different goals, but it's, it's to the benefit not only to us as a neighborhood or community, also the council members. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Susan Bruce. I have a good idea. Uh, I'm with Grace Point Church. Uh, I also need to be a lady for something. Uh, I haven't really seen a lot of ladies in San Antonio. I make about 150 a day. So to see a 64% ladies is overwhelming. But secondly, and I think the much is often in the news talking about this like, where do we get this money to pay this? That, I mean, as anybody, you know, I'm sure you thought about it, but where do we get this? And do we, is this going to be living inflation? Because once this happens, everybody down the line is the same. And so when is the amount I had to look at everything. I looked at the fact that I thought that the officials spent a lot of money to go to where we are, with the campaigns, how do I, how do I get that money back? You know, I'm looking at that. I look at the staff that you support. I see all of that as well. I look at some of our people that represent the high school. They go to the events. I get that. But I see the managers, the principals, the teachers that roll up their sleeves every day where they want to go to work in life, and they still do it. But they're willing to accept five through seven. You get me? And if they ask for a little bit more, they knock that down. I remember when the contact with the teacher said they knock that down. And I get it, but right at this point, it said to it to the public for discussion. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Rita from a across the street. I was shocked at 64%. Um, they, it's been repeated numerous times. They knew what the job was. They knew what the compensation was. All of a sudden, some home and an officer, what, four or five months, and they feel like, they deserve the 64% because the cost of living in Hawaii is hard. Well, you know what? It's hard for everybody. And where does that money come from? It comes from us, taxpayers. And I think to myself, what next? Is it full time or is it not full time? They say they're working full time, but yet they're looking at making it full time. It's very confusing. And the thought is this think about this. They get that 64%. Our legislators are going to say, you know what? We take care of the whole state. We deserve a loan too. We deserve more compensation too. Sylvia Luke already went over her budget. This money is coming from us. They just don't seem to get it. So uh, I say put in the resolution. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we have a uh, resolution on the floor. Um, we'll roll call vote, Billy. All right, thank you. Just to be clear, the motion on the table <clears throat> uh, moved by Rogers, seconded by Kuehu, is to adopt the resolution requesting the Honolulu City Council to conduct a public hearing and vote on resolution 23 82 relating to council pay raises. Agadir. Holm. Kuehu? Pardon me, that was, thank you. Melendrez. Mi Miyamoto. Oishi. He's on there. 
Can you do a thumbs up or thumbs down for me, Stanton? What's a I? Thank you. Rogers. Kamashiro. Hazama. Aye. All right. Motion passes with one, two, seven in favor. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Alice. Okay, moving on to residents' concerns. Are there any residents' concerns this evening that are not on our agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Armstrong, go ahead. Hold on, you muted. Sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. My name is Robert Armstrong. I'm on the Downtown Chinatown Neighborhood Board. And as you may know, the neighborhood plan has not really been looked at or updated in a significant way in about 15 years. So I'd like to make you aware of a meeting that we've got planned in the Chinatown neighborhood that's um, open to the entire public of this island on Saturday, 19th of August at 1 o'clock. That's 19th of August. 1 o'clock at the New Live Center at 1152 Smith Street. That's the old Channel 14 television studios. And um, what we have planned for that uh, uh, time is to have a grassroots democratic organizational meeting of what we should do in terms of updating the neighborhood plan. Uh, many of us uh, believe in this system, have invested hours, lives, and treasure in uh, this being the most effective system for our island. And so whether we take a look at the neighborhood board itself uh, and its systems and its boundaries and, and how elections are, are held or how minutes are being tabulated or how the commissioners are selected or whatever, it's all up for this organizational meeting. I have no agenda other than we need to refresh, rejuvenate and renew the neighborhood plan again. It's Saturday, 19th of August at 1 o'clock, New Life Center at 1152 Smith Street, and there's Sydney parking right behind the building, so off of Baratania. So I hope everybody who's watching and listening and who cares about democracy on this island will attend. And thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Armstrong. Appreciate it. Anyone else with uh, residents or community concerns this evening? Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. We got a uh, letter from uh, Paul Casey about water tanks which i didn't even know were there i think um steven handled that with um, Pardon me Stephen addressed that with uh, boy water supply earlier. it has been yes. resolved mm -hmm. okay thank you okay, any other any concerns okay Unnoticed in the past month or two, and it, it's more out of a, just sharing what I had noticed. Uh, of course, uh, being being a retired uh, military service member myself, can't help but just uh, appreciate what our service members do. First and foremost, uh, there was a couple occasions this past month, and, and I'm probably not aware of what's involved. But I see Lieutenant Colonel and and Pelos here. Uh, and, and it has to do with uh, some of the convoy activity that uh, has to occur on, on the freeway. Uh, I had just seen it yesterday. Uh, but, and how uh, that, that activity on the freeway obviously adjusts how the driving occurs on the freeway, especially with the, the reduction in speed. So um, yesterday, I, I just happened to encounter that coming home. And what I had saw, in, in uh, from my perspective anyway, uh, was uh, some risk of, of uh, 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 potential accidents because of the sudden slowdown uh, uh, with, with the convoy activity. I'm not sure if it was a uh, 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 school field, a uh, 25th ID, or uh, could, have been, uh, could have been the Hawaii Army National Guard, I'm not sure. But what I had thought to myself was, a lot of times when I see that kind of activity on the freeway uh, uh, with the state in particular, there's there's uh, uh, added, uh, I think, uh, a layer of security by, for instance, uh, the local police department where 
here as well. We need to be upfront, upfront and behind to, to, to kind of give everybody awareness on, on this, this uh, traffic activity. I, I, I did not see any of that with the convo yesterday, and that kind of concerned me with number one, the safety for our military personnel, and number two, the safety for everyone driving in and around that activity. So uh, I just kind of wanted to share that because I had noticed that uh, once or twice in as many months, uh, how that can be helped, I'm not sure, but uh, what I had seen was uh, a, a lot of uh, close, sorry, uh, close calls uh, throughout the uh, uh, freeway activity as I was going up each three or with the uh, convoy uh, uh, on the track on on the freeway, so it's just uh, as far as community concerned, just something I wanted to share. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other community concerns? Chair. Yeah. Um. Yesterday I was in town, and it looked like um, a lot of the military vehicles had just arrived. It looked like they were picking them up from Map. They were out in Kalihi, where Mapson and Young Brothers is. And they were all coming up through those tiny little side streets. And the last vehicle has the convoy sign on it. But when they're trying to get across in the midst, I mean, they're trying to swerve through people. They've got the trailers on the back with whatever equipment. And you could maybe get to through the traffic light at that turn. So I don't know what the protocol is that maybe they should have escort vehicles, at least to stop the intersection traffic, because they nearly took out cars and cars nearly rammed into them because they're not stopping at the stop sign. They're just coming out those side streets like Democrat Street, Republic. They came up that back uh, Libby Street. And I mean, it's tight enough that as it was and for them to maneuver through those tiny streets and then not stop at stop sign and try to get through the red lights. And again, that convoy sign was on the last vehicle. And so all the rest of them were up on Nimitz, but they can't stop. So I think that's legitimate, especially when they're on the freeway. But maybe there should be escort vehicles to help maneuver them through at least the sm smaller streets. I don't, I don't know where they were going, who they were for. They were those um, desert brown vehicles. Okay, thank you. The colonel put that. <laughs> All right, any other community concerns or residents concerns? Okay, we'll move on to our elected officials report, Office of Governor Green, um, Melanie Martin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Chair Hazama and members of the Neighborhood Board. My name is Melanie Martin and I am the uh, Josh, Governor Josh Green's representative. A couple of months, yeah, we haven't had meetings. So in May and June, a particular note in the governor's newsletter, which you can get online, is uh, good news. We opened our first medical respite call hale in the back of the Department of Health in their parking lot in Governor Green's backyard. And it houses like 10 individuals who are recently uh, released from Queens and who still need medical attention. So there is a medical unit there as well as a manager on site and 24 seven security. So it's really cool. It's like little, little units where they can stay. So that was uh, opened early June. We had a blessing on May 26. So you can read about that in the newsletter. It was put together by a nonprofit home aid Hawaii. And it's managed by Project Vision Hawaii. So it's really quite exciting to see. In addition, there are, it's not in the newsletter, but Governor Green signed a whole bunch of bills recently, some having to do with homelessness and housing needs. In fact, tomorrow he's gonna sign 10 bills related to that issue. Some of the other bills that he signed of particular interest and notes is the 280 million for the rental housing revolving fund, a Kalhale money, 15 million in fiscal year 24, and 33 million in fiscal year 25, and 150 million for HF, HCDA, I'm sorry for infrastructure improvements for housing developments. There's some 
firearm bills that he's recently signed, anti-vaping bills, and uh, other things related to like mitigating the impacts on state parks. So that, that's pretty much what I have tonight, Chair Hazama. Any any questions? I'm happy to answer. Thank you for your report. Any questions for the governor's office this evening? Okay, go ahead, Stephen. <clears throat> Hi, Stephen Melendres here. I have a comment. Um, I really enjoyed the discussion, the presentation concerning the use of pesticides in Hawaii. Uh, before moving to Mililani, I had a house up on the water in uh, Wailua, next door to the uh, polo field there. Very nice area. And I supported the community well. I love the North Shore area. But one thing that was disturbing, though, is that when I saw one of the uh, landowners there spraying pesticide across the street, literally, across the street from the elementary school. And we complained and I, sw I saw it. And the person that was spraying was dressed like he was in a spacesuit, literally, okay? And I said, what are they doing there? And we checked it out. And it was a machine that went through and sprayed the pesticide. What was disturbing about it is across the street from the, from the elementary school. So we complained and they said, well, they do it when, and the, it's a blow down, which keeps the pesticide down, but the wind will kick it up. There is no safe way to spray to spray pesticide uh, close to an inhabited area. So, you know, Dr. Green, I know I know Josh Green. He's a great guy. He has a heart for the community, heart for the people. And I would like to see if he could support anything through our legislation from his optics concerning the use of the restricted pesticides, especially with the numbers that we saw tonight. And so I'd like to put that out there for Governor Green to consider and supporting the community to help alleviate the restrictive pesticides and to control it. I'm not saying to not do it at all. Actually, in discussion with, well, mention with Monsanto, they're using what they use because they've used it for years. And a lot of times, these companies don't look at for other, maybe less obtrusive pesticides because they have, they're calculating their margin and they know that they can use this pesticide and it gives them what they need and they still maintain their profit base. Perhaps it's time that we look at what alternates do we have. We want to have, you know, healthy food, good food, etc., but we don't want to do it in damaging the environment and the population. So I thank you for for letting me share that, and I really do appreciate uh, Governor Green's support. Thank you, thank you. thank you for that comment. Thank you for that comment. I I share your concerns. If I can get a copy of that PowerPoint presentation, which was well done. I would appreciate it. I'd share that with the governor so that his team will understand where we're coming from with respect to the community and our concerns. And so, yeah, so if I can get a copy of that, that'd be great. Hi, um, so <clears throat> on this agenda at the backside, uh, we have a yeah. link to the board's Google Drive. I'll be dropping that in tomorrow morning. Right on. Thank you. So, all for the public, too, as well. You can see the full report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the governor's office? Again, Rita Kamakimura, and it's just a reminder, please ask the governor to veto House Bill 525 and the Senate version is the digital currency. I have <laughs> I have emailed him. I've called his office. I know it's a pain, but it's very important to many of us. So um Please tell them to veto it for watching. Thank you. Uh, what, which bill? 525 House bill or Senate bill? Sorry. House bill 525. Okay. And I don't remember the number for the Senate bill, but they're the digital currencies. I'm okay. sure he's gotten many, many uh, emails and phone calls. Okay, so just, I'll share that. Just a reminder. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the governor's office this evening? I don't know, this is governor's office, so it's for Mel. Melanie. Yes. Yeah, uh, I just kind of want to follow on to uh, uh, Rita's uh, uh, a nice input there. Uh, it's more of a, a, a question on uh, the governor's intentions on uh, line item vetoes uh, that we can anticipate. Uh, uh, Rita had uh, emphasized what uh, she 
uh, along with I'm uh, I'm sure uh, uh, other uh, uh, constituents uh, 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 concur with. But uh, is there specifically, and and it's probably out there uh, uh, on uh, on information that I haven't missed. Uh, I've missed. But can can you say uh, specifically from the governor's office of uh, what we can anticipate in the next week or two on no kidding uh, uh, vetoes that uh, we can uh, anticipate from the governor? Thank you. I'm not really sure if it's on their their the governor's website, but there was a press release with various line item vetoes, and one of them was the five million dollars first responders building in the tech park. And I can't remember what the other ones are on the, off the top of my head, but there were several. And the reason why is because he had to reduce the budget by almost a billion dollars due to the Council of Revenues projections that came in um, a little lower than expected. So I'm not sure if it's on the website, I, the line item veto, the items, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions for governor's office? Hey, none. Thank you, Melanie. Appreciate it. Okay, we have a representative you. from Congressman at Chase's office on this evening. Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to office of Mayor Blandiardi. Um, Carrie, good evening. Good evening, Chair Hazama. Good evening. Um, Everyone, uh, Carrie Castle, uh, Deputy Director with the Budget and Fiscal Services Department, representing Mayor Rick Blangiardi this evening. Um, I wanted to share um, a, a link to uh, to the Mayor's June newsletter. Maybe Dylan can help me with that. Um, as always, lots of good information. Uh, in the newsletter, uh, the highlight for uh, the city and um, uh, a major milestone that I'm sure everyone is aware of is that rail will will start on June 30th. Uh, we, we'll have the first opportunity to ride the rail and through the July 4th weekend of rail will be free. For the public to to ride, so um, I'll, I'll just share that particular item. Um, but as I mentioned, um, many good uh, uh, updates in the mayor's newsletter. Um, I'll head right into the issues from the last meeting at this point. Um, first one being the. Uh, Mililani Malka Park and Ride, and it's regarding the bicycle shelter. Um, so this particular issue has been discussed probably over the last maybe three meetings that we've had now. Um, the question was whether the um, a study can be done to determine if the bike shelter is being used by bicyclists. Um, on uh, April 18th, uh, the DTS, uh, Department of Transportation Services staff, um, they did a number of inspections uh, that were conducted at the Mililani Park and Ride um, they determined uh, over the last, they looked at this over the last year and confirmed that the residents' observations that there is no demand for a dedicated bicycle storage structure at this location. So um, the comment on April 18th was that DTS will be preparing plans to have the bicycle shelter relocated. Um, However, I guess an, uh, a further update is that uh, there was discussion in our la in our meeting before last as to whether that is the desire of the community to have the shelter relocated. Um, so on February, I'm sorry, on April 28th, um, 
our Department of Transportation Services. Again, they, the staff conducted a field investigation at the park and ride on April 27. Uh, the staff at DTS confirmed that the shelter door was locked and the facility is secured. Uh, the staff also confirmed that there is no record as to keys for access. Um, for the facility, um, which su such that um, the keys were never issued to residents who requested the use of the bicycle shelter. Um, I think the comment that I, I guess is still open for clarity is um, there's a note that indicates that Chair Hazama was going to um, prepare a letter requesting additional information to DTS. So if we could get some clarity on where that matter stands, it would be appreciated. Uh, Chair Hazama. Okay, so I was just going to call them, but I understand I, after I read their report, apparently they already conducted the study in the uh, facility to be relocatable. And I guess they confirmed the fact that it is secured and not for them. Even if a resident wanted to use it, they would not be able to use it anyway. And I don't know how the city would issue keys to certain about they would do that. Well, so at this point in time, I will um, make a final confirmation with DPS and basically give them the um, give them the okay to proceed with the relocation. Now I have no idea where they're gonna put this. Um, but I think if I talk to them, then they'll, they'll probably indicate to me that they're thinking in this tweet. But I think that's where we're at, Terry, with this issue. Okay. Thank you. So, um, anything else on your report? Uh, we have two more items. Okay, go ahead. Okay, on the second item regarding a traffic sign that uh, was repeatedly hit by drivers. So. The, the issue was that there's a traffic sign emerge and no U-turn located at the intersection of Maheula Parkway and Makai'i Street fronting the fire station that has been hit and knocked down several times. Uh, residents request that a candlestick delineators be installed around the sign to increase visibility of the signage. Um, it was also requested that the Department of Transportation communicate with the Honolulu Fire Department to ensure that the sign and delineators do not obstruct the uh, Honolulu Fire Department's response time. So in response to that issue, uh, our Department of Facilities Maintenance uh, discussed this concern with our um, Department of Transportation Service Services traffic engineering division that is reviewing and evaluating the site signage as well as uh, HFD's apparatus access requirements. A completion of their review, the uh, Department of Transportation will prepare a paint, will prepare a paint and sign work order uh, for the appropriate improvements or modifications. Any questions? No, I think I've got that one. <laughs> okay. So the third item, the last item, uh, had to do with donation containers at the Mililani Park and Ride. Um, how can a nonprofit organization such as Goodwill acquire a permit to establish a large container for donation drop-offs at the Park and Ride lot? Uh, indicating that there are various nonprofits that are interested in applying for permits. So our Department of Transportation Services um, indicates that uh, please refer to ROH Chapter 38 uh, of the lease and rental of city real property, um, Section 3.2, uh, 3A. So. It indicates that DTS may award concessions to 501 nonprofit organizations primarily engaged in physical 
rehabilitation programs such as Goodwill on terms and conditions approved by the city's corporation council as to form and legality without calling for public bid. Although the exemption from the public bid process, although the exemption from the public bid process qualified certain nonprofit entities, um, they are required to pay concession fees for the use of the ground space at that uh, facility. Um, if there are any further questions regarding this ROH and uh, you know, potential for other nonprofits to utilize the um, park and ride, um, please call the Department of Transportation um, Performance and Development Division at 808-768-8342. And that's all I have tonight, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, so, Milani Park and Ride, um, a couple months back, um, the um, mistaken lines, parking lines that were there next to the uh, bus shelter were removed. Thank you for having that done so quickly. Um, what started happening, though, is the people who were parked there when there were lines continued to park there without lines because they're just used to it. And when they come, it's dark. They don't notice there's no line and what have you. So there was a situation where police department was called um, and they were not addressing anything. They didn't, you know, they didn't cite them for anything because to them, there's no signage. There's no nothing. Although it is very clear. It's a drive in driveway on the inside. Um, so I did happen to be there when police officers were called. They, the person who called asked me to wait, so I waited. And um, one officer did ticket the car, but it could have been for something else. Um, I talked to the sergeant. They would have to look it up. They don't know what it was cited for, but it could have been something other than parking outside of a parking stall. Um, in the interim, another officer came out and she was very clear. There's no signage. She can't do anything. And she stayed on the phone with um, BFM. I, I told her to call DTS. She called whoever she wanted to. Um, either way, I had called DTS because I had to think out of the box now, right? Because there's no way we're going to put signs up to say no parking along this whole entire area. It's just ridiculous. It's not within a budget that I would think of in the next five years. However, if you paint that part of the curb red, that is pretty standard knowledge. You don't have to. I mean, we all know you shouldn't park within 10 feet of a driveway, but some places like Newtown, you have to have signs because people still park there. So to help our police officers or district too, I thought, if I could get some red paint, me and my kids would be happy to paint it for free. I just don't want to put the wrong color red paint. So I think DTS was kind of sort of starting to look at that and see if that's a viable option. I'm wondering if we can do a follow up and see, because um, I've painted the city bathrooms before because the, the graffiti that pops up and I asked for some paint and they, it, the maintenance guy brought me some paint and some paint brushes and me and my kids, we went and did it. So I'm wondering if that's a way maybe outside of the box thinking that we could just paint that part of the curb red to obviously make it known and police officers can then address because that's a signal that there's no parking there. Thank you. Any other questions for mayor's office? Go ahead, Alex. Um, I made I made copies of, uh, un unfortunately, I was not trying to, uh, it had to do with bus routes that you're changing because of the uh, rail. And I made both two copies of the routes and I'd like to know how you're going to disseminate that information, how you're going to get it out. Uh, I do remember a couple of years ago, I was out in Holly Eva and I think it was bus route 52 was changed and it caused a whole bunch of uh, consternation among bus riders. So I'm interested in knowing what the office is going to do to get that information out to everybody. Yes, Alice, um, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, as you mentioned, uh, because the rail has um, added more bus service, um, you know, to make sure that connections are, are, are there and available. Um, they have uh, communicated some of the changes in the bus routes. Um, I'm sure it is on the website. Let me um, work on 
providing you with a link to that information. I'll be happy to get back to you on that. Actually, I have I have the copies because I didn't okay. I printed them off, so I I know well, I'm just I, I'm okay. just asking how you're going to get that information every uh, you know out to everybody. Well, a lot of people that ride the bus don't necessarily have computers. Well, uh, we're not you know I can't think of disseminating a uh, hard copy to <laughs> you know the the entire community. So. Um, it is available. Um, I will be happy to to provide a link. Um, in addition, I can uh, inquire as to where we can get hard copies, where the public can get hard copies of the of the bus route information, and report back to you. Okay. Sure. Okay. I have a question regarding that. Maybe OTS can put maybe flyers up at different the stations that will have changes, maybe pre preempting the change so bus riders can see the information at their bus pickup, the bus stop, and then they can kind of sort of get that in there. Just very simple that this route is changing to this route or something, something like that. Nothing that has to be disseminated everywhere, but um, getting it out there. Because I know like for my mother-in-law, this whole link thing should just be confused, but if she saw it at her bus, her regular bus stop, and she lives in senior housing, so a lot of them rely on the bus stops through Wahiwa, Mindilani, Malka. Um, I think just having it stationary at stops would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, other? Um, Carrie, just one clarification on the the free rail um, rides. Yes. I think after June thirtieth, um, it's going to be free, but I think they have to have a holo card to get on, right? Uh, they do have to have a whole a card to get on. So they won't be charged. The card will not be charged, but you have to use your whole card to get on the rail. It's free, but you need your card. Well, you can't just walk on. Before the 30th, yes. I think you can just go on without anything. But after the 30th, they're going to stop you. That, sure. that is correct. I have a quick question regarding the rail. Are, do all the stations have ample parking? Or where it, is it going to be designated where people should park if there's no parking at that rail station? Or are you not stopping at those rail stations? What's the plan for locating? I think they, I think they did do a release. There are only three stations that currently have parking. One is Halava. The other one is at West Oahu, and the other one's at um, Oakley. I think those are the three station stops that have parking. It, none of the other ones have any parking. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Okay, moving on to District 8, Council Member Okimoto, Val. Mahalo, good evening, Chair, members of the board, members of the community. Um, on behalf of Council Member Weyer and myself, he apologized for not being here, but he did send his representative. But we, as a council, you know, Matt and I were really well together. We wanted to just mahalo you guys. We know that you guys are voluntary and that this is not a paid position. And with the elections coming through, we know that you um, ended a year term. I, I actually am, I apologize. I'm not sure if this is the new ones that came through the election, but on behalf of Council Member Weyer and myself, we just wanted to present some certificates of appreciation for you guys. Um, and so Carrie's going to help me. I'm just going to read up the names. And this is, uh, again, a mahalo from the city council to you guys. So. Teresa Kuehu, thank you. Alice Roger, Susan Miyamoto, Chair Dean Hazama, okay. and Keith Tamashiro, and um, Stephen Melendres, thank you so much. Um, again, we want to just mahalo you guys. I do have my new. And I do have some, I, I wasn't able to put it up front. So if anybody in the community wants it before um, when I'm done, I can hand it out to you. I'll go over my report and then um, answer some of the questions that you probably have based on the prior discussion and then take any other questions. So thank you again for having me tonight. 
Um, my report again is usually done at the beginning of the month. So some of the information might be a little outdated, but hopefully it's still pertinent. And because the district is so large, it does have some parts of it that aren't directly pertaining to Mililani, but it's helpful to know. So we are halfway through the year and summer is here. I was able to help um, celebrate many of our graduates and, and District 8 actually has several high schools, but Mililani High School is, is the largest in District 8. So really grateful that I had the opportunity to to celebrate, we had, I think, 90, I think it was 98 or 96 valedictorians larger than any other school. I'm trying to encourage my daughter who's going to be a soft, who's going to be a junior if she can try and be a valedictorian. I'm not sure how that will last, but I'm encouraging her. Um, uh, this also marks the beginning of hurricane season, as it says here. So we have some hurricane tips, but just for um, some council information, actually, I'll go in order. So some Honolulu County updates. We did hear um, from the mayor's representative about the rail opening on June 30th. And like Chair Hazama said, the ideal thing is to, we're encouraged to get the whole of cars before the 30th, from June 30th to July 1st. The rides will be free, but you do need that car to, to access the rail. And although initially the project was going to have that park and ride at the YL station, that's no longer right now on the table. They're, Trying to figure out what to do there. We just had a meeting today in our committee of transportation and I asked director Morton from the transportation committee. I'm sorry from DTS what the plans were. So the, the 1st phase goes from the west side to Aloha stadium. And the best thing for us, I wanted to know specifically how it, because it does impact council member wires and our district here. How can we access the, the, the train, the rail? So the best thing for us, I think, is to get to the parking rights here. And then access the rail. Um, yeah, sorry, got on a bus here and then access the bus to the rail at the YL station. It is a little bit tricky because of the crosswalk. They are by the I think the 22nd of this this week. They're planning on finishing a raised um, crosswalks and flashing lights to make it more safe because I I pass by there often as many of us do, and it is a little dangerous and tricky. So we're you know we're encouraging the riders to just be careful as you're trying to access that. Another suggestion given to me, which I'm not sure, I wanted to know again how, how our district riders could get onto the rail. A suggestion from Director Morton was to park at the stadium and then from there catch a bus to town. I, I, to me, that didn't seem as um, a possible solution to get onto the rail, but hopefully as the project continues and we go past Aloha Stadium, that's something that will be more feasible for our community because we we aren't being able to access a park and ride right now. Um, some information about the summer mills program, if you have Kiki or family that um, would benefit from this, there's a bunch of schools here that participate in schools that will be participating in that free public program. Some of the inside community um, events that I was able to attend, there's a lot of school events supporting our education, Melanie Ike May Day, as well as I mentioned the high school graduation, working with um, the mayor's office as well for the Melanie Outdoor Hockey Rink, which is outside of the Malka district, but I know that a lot of our residents actually have teams that use that, that facility or that outdoor rink. And I think just for legislative um, information on the second to the last page. This again is probably information that was more pertinent at the beginning of the month, but I can kind of give you some ideas. Hold on, let me make sure I'm getting my notes here. Okay. So we finalized um, the city budget, 3.4 billion for fiscal year 2024, and that had we had a deadline of June 15th. Our last full council meeting was June 7th. And my write up here has some information about it. I think one of the main things that you probably heard on the news was between the mayor's office and, our, and the council, we approved a $350 property tax credit that will provide some tax relief for high valuations earlier in the year while also maintaining key city services. That was something I know Chair Waters is really working hard on. So, what can we do to offer more permanent long uh, tax relief versus just temporary? But with the assessments, I know that it's challenging right now since all the home values have really ballooned. Um, another bill that was passed through our health department, or I think we're going to hear it tomorrow. Sorry, I think it's the, the second reading tomorrow in in health. Okay, the naloxone bill. So Bill 28 will seek to mandate that bars and nightclubs keep naloxone on their premises. Um, I actually raised concerns about the access to this 
drug, or I'm sorry, not a drug, this, this medicine, which is very helpful, but I did have concerns about how it was going to be enforced and um, it did pass full council reading, but it's going to go back to the health committee tomorrow. We meet again, but just to give you an idea, that's going to be mandated in all um, restaurants and places of that sell liquor. And that's to help with any incidences of um, an overdose to keep the public safe. Again, my my concern was I would like have, I would have liked to have seen it not be mandated. I'm not usually for mandates, but more have it accessible to all. Because when I asked um, the director, our EMS director, if there's statistics about these things happening, where the need for it is at bars and restaurants, they actually didn't have that information. It was anywhere. So just wanted to put that out there. Um, just and then, you know, I, I know that we had a really hearty discussion earlier on the salaries and I really want to mahalo the members of the community and the board for being so respectful. I really do appreciate that because I know that this has been such a sensitive and divisive um, topic across the board. And I, I, I've done my best to, to study and look at all of the information and the facts and um, because of Sunshine Law, which is a different um, aspect of a council that I didn't have to deal with in the state legislature. It was a little bit more challenging to to come to an agreement and I couldn't always be public. But to be honest, a lot of my information was I was gathering along the way as I watched the commission um, hearings and as I would um, gather the information. So I, I just wanted to maybe I'm not sure if clarify, but I know many of you have wondered, OK, where has my stance been? And I did come up public in June 7th. Um, I, I, I did also in a town hall meeting. Um, in Pearl City, IAEA to kind of, that also was a sensitive thing because there were other people there from the council, but I, I do wanna mahalo you guys. So just to give you a kind of a background of the information that I got that helped me to come to my decision, you know, the salary commission there, the reason for, I guess, their tough decision that they had to make in their charter, it says the commission shall set salaries in accordance with the principles of adequate compensation for work performed and preservation of a sensible relationship with the salaries of other city employees. And I know member um, board member Rogers mentioned the 19 of the 33, and that's something that I had to learn because I'm gonna be honest, I, until I started watching the commission hearings, I didn't understand how they came up with numbers. In the media at first, it was really high. It was, I think, 150%, like was mentioned, but they they used their, um, what they did, it they did the background research and then that's how they came up with this kind of in-between number. But if at that 19 year, 19 of the last 33 times that a, a salary was recommended, it was rejected or deferred. So, you know, the usually the four to five percent is what's given, but even if you take a three percent conservative number of a salary increase and you take that and you multiply it by 19, this is how I process it in my head. That's 57 percent non compounded that was deferred. So, if you were to do that at a compounded rate, it would not, it would probably be close to, if not over 64 percent. And those are the things that I think was was really trying for me to understand because I know that right now the commission was left with this feat to to catch up because it had to in, in, um, address inflation as well as to do what their charter is requiring them to do, which I just read to you. Um, so the salary commission, you know, I also learned through their meetings that the Honolulu City Council is actually the lowest paid. Um, council in the state, despite having the largest population. And this is, again, things I, I learned just from watching and, and doing my own research. I understand that this is a very negative um, situ situation. The optics aren't the best. And I wish I, I would have preferred to have this increase staggered. I understand that that's something that most of us would have seen. But again, when you think about the, the 19 times that it was deferred, to me, I, had, I was faced with the decision, do we keep on doing this? And I want to really... Um, echo what Chair Hazama said, to me, the problem is not necessarily the 64%, although that looks really bad. To me, the issue is that I don't think that the process is done properly. We have to really adjust the process. No other council right now in any of our other counties here in the state actually has the authority to, to even touch the salary. The commission sets it and that's what goes through. And for some reason, it puts us in a very difficult situation, which is probably why 19 of the last 33 times it was deferred because it politicizes the, the process and people are afraid of election results or people are afraid of you know, conflicts of interest. And so that's why that was deferred, unfortunately. So I came, I had to face the decision where am I just going to be afraid of an election or am I going to write this to kind of steer the ship right again to write a course that's been um, kind of misguided for all these decades or for almost two decades. So I did make that tough decision and 
to me, I think what I want to do moving forward is exactly what Chair Hazama said. Figure out the process because I would like to see where we are, like the other colonies. I think Maui was the most recent where they removed themselves from the situation. Um, unlike what I think a lot of the media is sharing, we don't actually vote. We don't choose the number. We don't choose the salary percentage, or we don't. We have no say in it. The commission sets it based on their recommendation. And while part of them are chosen from the mayor, and I think part of it is chosen from the a council, these, when I watched them, they really had done their homework and I give them credit for that. To, to, for them to put themselves out there really was a, a challenging thing, I think. And the increases weren't just for us, it was across the board. The mayor and his department has actually got some um, increases as well. So I, a lot of the conversation I heard, and again, I think in what we heard repeatedly was the public didn't have a chance to to speak, but they did have opportunities, multiple opportunities in the commission hearings. And the reason that um, in the hearing that we had on June 7th, that actually wasn't because we're not voting on our raises. So that wasn't a thing where we are saying we're going to vote on our raises. That's never that was never the situation. But Chair Waters actually did allow a lot of um, feedback based on Bill 10, which was the, the budget bill, the le legislative budget bill. And one of the things I did hear repeatedly was that people should have been, um, should have a vote. And, you know, I went and did some research while in the hearing and I had my team do it. And so in 1992, that was the vote that people voted for the commission to be set. And again, while I know that the optics of it is so difficult and I, it pains me because I know that many people don't understand why I'm making this tough decision. I, I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing to bring it back to where it should have been over the last two decades. And, you know, to be honest, when I'm in the community, the, the concerns that are being brought to me, while this is something that's in the public, in the media um, being publicized, when I'm out in the community, I'm, the struggles that people are facing, that they're coming to me with are public safety. We had a lot of issues with public safety, and I'm still working on that. Homelessness and um, violence related to homelessness in, in this part of the community, but other parts of the district. Public safety, even parks, um, trees. So. I'm not trying to dismiss the concerns that the residents have based on this, but when it came down to it, my office and I, while flooded with similar requests to, to um, reject the pay raise or to vote against the pay raise, which was, again, never the situation, we had to choose if we we're going to address the concerns that the, the community really wants us to address or, or hear the, these cries. And I, I don't want to be dismissive, but I had to make that decision. Um, and so my team and I have been focusing on what we can do to address the concerns in the district. Um, I do appreciate those who have been respectful. I, I do appreciate those who have been able to agree to disagree. And unfortunately, you know, divisiveness has come out throughout this process. And it's unfortunate because that's not the aloha spirit that I was raised with. But I'm going to do my best I, to be logical and not base my decisions just purely on emotion. So I will gladly, or well not gladly, I will welcome your concerns and do my best to be honest. And if we have to agree to disagree, then I hopefully we can do it respectfully. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for? I just have one on the rail. Okay. okay so I understand the the board tanks, especially North Shore District Two and District Eight, and the fact that. Uh, Parking garage down in Hidden Age. So, however, the transit center for Highlands is still in the plan. Correct. Thank you, Chair, for clarifying that. I think District 2 and you and um, Councilmember Wire need to push DTS to expedite that transit center to get built. Well, the center is there. It's not. They told us that, that that's why they're building that raised crosswalk right now. That's supposed to be done before yeah, June 30th. But the the transit center for the buses to actually. Oh, okay. You would be able to catch an express bus to the North Shore or from here. It will take you directly to the Pro Highland Transit Center, which will get you onto the city. Okay. Right now. Definitely. I, as we sit when it's open. It's not. The rail isn't. Okay. So the residents from North Shore and here have to track to the Waipahu Transit Center to get on, which is going in the wrong direction. Correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I know that I've been really bugging Director Morton about that, so I will definitely continue to push because it is disappointing that we didn't get the. So what should have happened is when they took the garage out, they should have started working on the transit center. But okay. Was, you're right. Our residents up here in District Two have no way of getting into it. And that was kind of the saving grace initially when the project was 
Okay, thank you for bringing that to my attention and we'll work on that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, Appreciate thank you. It. Okay, District 2, Council Member Fire, but Kelly's here. Members of the board, um, Kelly Anaya from Council Member Matt Fire's office. Um, just got a few updates um, on the uh, newsletter that I passed out. Um, Council Member did introduce um, Bill 34 and 35 related to the property tax. So, um, I'm not sure if you know, but um, Council Member was part of the big group, the big traction group. I believe they were not allowed to pass any kind of decision regarding the So, these two bills, I believe, are going to be up for the next council. The bill 34 addresses the exemption. It'll raise the exemption, um, well, homeowner um, exemption to $250,000. Then for 65 years and for about two. So for um, 35, it relates to the evaluation process that they provide at the assessment. So hopefully that you know, by using an average assess value, you know, can help not make their assistance. He's watching. I know, and I don't need to have my glasses on. Uh, he also introduced a reso, um, <laughs> um needing a plan for the parking ride um, that both council passed. Um, so they're looking into possibilities of um, like putting housing on top so the cost per stall isn't like the hundreds of thousands of dollars that they She said DTS will continue to provide space. That's all I have. Okay. Yeah. Any, Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just have a question. I know that I know, by the way, three hundred thousand dollars for me is you know, I know. I, I, uh, however, <laughs> my question, my question to the mayor's office uh, two months ago went something like this: that there should be some way, other than watching property um, uh, sale prices go up, and then the assessments happen. That there should be some way to categorize that, and I suggested to the mayor's office, mayor's cabinet, right? Uh, that if we couldn't come up with that information ourselves, we could always poll some of the places on the mainland and find out how they do it. Because surely there's a better way to do it than, oh well, my house is one over a million dollars, so therefore I'm going to pay fourteen hundred dollars every six months or whatever. Uh, there should be a better way to do that. That, that doesn't depend on the sales prices going up because the sales prices came back down and then the interest rate went up. So all of that combined is not a good thing. So it seems already doing something. Would you like to mention that to him that that would be a good little career move? Any, any other questions for um, the wise office? Okay, thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, moving on to State Senator De La Cruz's office. David, are you on? Is anybody on from Senator Hello. De La Cruz? Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Malcolm. Oh. I'm from Senator De La Cruz's office. I work with David. And apologies, I'm in my car right now. My roommates are being very social, so I wanted a quiet place to attend this meeting. Um, all right, for this month's report. Um, as you all know, the legislative session adjourned on May 4th. Uh, next week, Monday, the governor will finalize his intent to veto list. Uh, we also mailed out our end of session newsletter, which many of you should have received. This newsletter gives a comprehensive overview of what is included in the budget. These items include 50 million for teacher housing, including for Mililani High School. Um, 6.5 million for a covered play court at Mililani High School, 3.5 million for Mililani High School softball, softball field improvements, $2.5 million for a covered play court at Kipapa Elementary, $1.6 million for AC renovations at Kipapa Elementary, and $1. million for Mililani EK parking lot renovations. And last month, David mentioned that you all had questions about 
uh, what's happening with the first responders tech campus. Um, as you all know, this is one of the items on the governor's veto list, um, but uh, Senator De La Cruz and the governor right now are in discussion about what's going to happen with that land that was originally planned for the FRTC. So that's what's happening there. Um, and I'm available for any questions if any of you have any. Okay. Question. Go ahead. Just a quick question. Um, sure. The monies that were allotted for the Mililani schools, were there any allotted for the Lahua or um, Wahua Middle? It's just because that's Laonani Valleys. Were there any allotments for those campuses or a Wheeler? Um, not at the top of my memory. Um, okay. I know there were some for Wahiwa, but I don't okay. have those items in front of me. All right, no problem. Just an FYI, Laonani Valley is, um, they're a part of the Wahiwa School District. So that covers um, Wheeler, Wheeler Elementary and uh, Wahiwa Middle and Lelahua High School for our meetings. Okay. okay. Thank you. Hey, any other questions for Senator? Kim up and thank you. Uh, District 38 representative. Hi, Lauren. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, chair, members of the board, members of the community. I wanted to, Teresa, I'll start off with saying I can show you on the Capitol website where you can look up the worksheets so you can see everything, all of the CIP that has been awarded for the state. It's very helpful to look at that. So I might put that in my, my next newsletter. Um, I wanted to start off, we were in recess last month in May, but I was up uh, in Maryland at Women in Government. I just became the national chair of Women in Government, which is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of state women legislators across the country. And so this was my first meeting that I got to chair as the chair. Um, and so I was also blessed to have uh, been selected as the recipient of the State Government Affairs Council Leadership Award. So that was a great conference where we focused on healthcare, economic resiliency, as well as education. And so also wanted to update on a few of the events that happened in the last two months. And so uh, Kipop Elementary, they, I was able to go there and jump rope with all of the children there to celebrate their end of the school testing was finished. And as well as I got to play in the foam pit with them, that was fun. Uh, congratulations to all of the Milani High School graduates. And then also I wanted to make sure I mentioned I had the opportunity to honor two Milani Malka elementary school students. And so they had a situation where two of the young boys were on their bikes and there was a Kapuna who was crossing the street and almost got hit. They stopped the truck and then helped the woman across. And so wanted to just really thank them for their good deed. And so their classmates were really excited for them. And so that was a, a wonderful time. And then also was able to go to the OIA banquet where Principal Murphy was awarded with the 10 year tenure award, 10 year tenure, which is a fun award to say. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to highlight was our Women's Legislative Caucus bill signing. As we talked, Governor Green went through many of the different bill signings, but a lot of bills relating to domestic violence and bills that the Women's Legislative Caucus had put in. And other than that, our, my full session wrap up will be mailed out to you in the next few weeks. So if you live in District 38, please be looking for the wrap up and I will be bringing it to the next neighborhood board. So if you have any questions there. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Any questions for Representative? Oh, oh yeah, come on up, please. Hey, hey Anna, nobody can hear you. Shit, us. Uh, uh, Representative uh, uh, Matsumoto, uh, th this question is pretty much re uh, relative uh, not only to Representative Matsumoto. Uh, but to the governor's office, the mayor's office, uh, more, more importantly, uh, our constituents and residents and all of our representatives and council members. In fact, council member um, uh, Okimoto kind of touched on it a little bit. And if this was discussed earlier, I apologize. And, and, and this is an evolving demographic, uh, for lack of a better word, of uh, transients, homelessness in Lani. I, I think we all see it. And uh, for me, uh, it may be uh, similar to others. 
there's a there's a degree of sympathy and there's a degree of concern on where this is going and how it's going to be addressed or if it's going to be addressed at all in any way. Uh, our law enforcement may have been here earlier and if they missed the opportunity, I apologize. Uh, so I, I think they're probably more uh, intimate to that concern from residents uh, if and when we see uh, what's going on and if there's anything being done to maybe stem it, or provide a solution to it. But while you're here, uh, Representative Matsumoto, if you have any on all of that. A quick question before I answer that. Have we had achieved zero recently present to the board? Been to the board, they've been inviting us to um, some of their meetings that they've held. Okay, so I think one of the first things I'd mention is for so long there were no services on the side of the island, right? Everything was in town. And so um, now Achieve Zero is here in Wahiwa. I know Rep Caruso works with them a lot as well, and I think Rep Lachika. I think they would be a great uh, person, a uh, great group to present at the board, the work that they're doing there. Because I also know they need a lot of support from the community as well um, and the core program. And we passed several bills this legislative session in regards to, to homelessness. And that will be in my next report. I'll have all the bill numbers um, for you there and all of the details. But I think the first thing I would say is having achieved zero here to have that question and answer to see where the community can come alongside because um, as as I know, and I think all of us know, legislation can't solve everything. That does have to be an entire community effort. And so I think that would be one of my my first suggestions. Okay, good idea. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, <clears throat> Lauren uh, I know the library and the Y have both that, so they've got that surrounding grassy area behind the library between the Y and that. They have had. They have had problems with the carpet <clears throat> in, in the front of the library as well as cold and stuff like that. The homeless are in the area. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is, if you go to the Mililani neighborhood board, this has been discussed a lot, especially by the park, um, by the Honganji, by Rec 3. Um, there's been a lot of issues there. So that's also maybe something where both of the boards can partner because it has been a long discussed issue down um, by REC 3. Okay. Any other questions for Representative Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Okay, District 46, Representative Caruso. Amy, good evening. Good evening. Um, okay, I have so much to talk to you about, but I'll, I guess I'll start where Lauren left off with it, which is essentially um, the work around homelessness. So um, we allocated about $64 million um, to different uh, types of efforts, $15 million for Housing First. Um, so our job now is to make sure that those monies are allocated in ways that are very specifically tailored for our communities. So Achieve Zero next Thursday at 6 o'clock is having a meeting. Um, at Wahiwa Elementary, everyone is invited to come because we really see this as a community building effort. Um, and we're going to first really focus our efforts on the folks who are houseless um, in Wahiwa and the vast majority of whom, you know, grew up in our communities, went to Leilihua High School, um, and, and how we can best support them. So that's happening. Um, and I also wanted to just mention um, and, and thank again, thank Fern for her work. Um, that data and her their analysis um, of the pesticide problem in central Oahu is something that I really hope that this neighborhood board takes seriously. Um, I, I'd like to work with the board to develop language around a resolution that we can take to our legislators and take to our governor um, really conveying the urgency of the situation. Um, and I, I don't know if uh, Fern has um, identified any local organizations that will be working on legislation in the next session or what specific uh, legislative proposals are going to be working on. But if I could ask her really quickly, like, if the, is there, are there any specific bills that you want us to really forefront? Are you really focused on buffer zones or reporting or um, are you really trying to just address a lot of different problems at the same time? Sorry, I'm asking. No, I'm asking for a question. 
Thank you, Representative, for the opportunity to answer that. Um, we are going to continue to push uh, next year for better reporting. Um, that's one of the top priorities is um, getting the data collected in a better form. Um, <clears throat> we'll also be pushing for buffer zones again um, and expanding the restricted use pesticide list as of right now. Um, and we continue to work on the ADC reform. Those have been the top priorities uh, associated with this topic. Okay, so those four things. Oh, and the, thank you. And I'll keep, um, I'll bring the board up to speed every time I talk to them and we'll have those conversations. So thank you. Um, and then I also want to mention to the board, um, because you may have questions, well, we did have a, a very robust discussion about the budget um, at our CNADA. And um, I, I wanted to, again, um, be as transparent as possible and open to questions from the community um, I voted as the chair of higher education in opposition to the budget because um, the cuts that were made to public education and um, the university's budget, in particular, the failure to restore the COVID cuts um, were inexplicable to me and um, they ha actually still have not been explained. So. Um, we've been having those kind of difficult conversations since session ended. We've also been having conversations about the implementation of legislation that did pass um, with the university, specifically around campus safety um, and around making the CTAR program more robust and, and well supported. Um, but I, I think as we move towards the next session, I, I really hope that the neighborhood boards can also be part of the conversations around the lease extent or the re lease renegotiation. I need the all of our communities to be really attentive to the progress that is or is not being made on that. Um, we've sent letters of inquiry to DLNR and to the AG. Um, so I'll be coming back to you folks with their responses uh, because our deadline is fast approaching and, and we have not, as far as I'm concerned, we have not made good progress. Um, we also are working on implementation of um, the majority caucuses tax credit bill. So there were some problems we had. We were able to double the food credit um, uh, and we we're able to double the EITC, both of which are refundable. But um, we also included a quadrupling of the child and dependent care tax credit. And that was really um, kind of the one of the most important measures that we passed this session. There are some problems with the language, so we're working on that now, but we're, I think we're gonna be able to fast track the corrections when we come back to session next time, um, hopefully in time for filing for this year. Um, and then the only other thing that I would say is that we sought funding for Kukani Loco, um, 13 million um, in the OHA budget, and that was cut and we're gonna be going back for um, re-examining Reexamination of that request next session as well, but also hopefully working with the board to see what other requests we should be including um, in our CIP budget. And I'm open to questions. <laughs> it's been a really um, tumultuous like May and June. So, okay. thank you, Amy. Any questions for Representative Service? Amy, what was the date of the uh, Chief Zero meeting at Rahoa Elementary? Um, that's going to be next Thursday, so I think that it's the 29th um, at Wahoo at 6 p.m. 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Okay, District 37, Representative Lachika. Good evening. Amy. Hello, everybody. Congratulations on your re-election and thank you for your service. Nice to see you in person, member Melendres. Um, so my first session is POW and I'm very excited to have participated um, this session. Um, mind my excitement, but I will read to you um, the CIP and GAA that I was able to get for the district. It's my first time getting to do that. So I'm quite excited about that, but um, we will get the veto list next week. So as soon as we get it, we'll caucus and then determine what we'll do. Okay, so some CIP. Um, this is not in for this board, but I we got 550,000 for Kanoe Lani L. So Waikio Gentry is part of my district for uh, classroom facilities for special ed students. I got to work with Senator De La Cruz on getting the $6 million for the covered play court. 
um, which will be shared space for their culinary robotics um, program, as well as a shared space covered space for the community. Um, in GIA funding, we got, um, I put in 200, um, we're advocated for the um, funding for Achieve Zero. So we got $200,000 for operating funds to, for, to have them continue serving the 600 plus individuals that they serve from Central Oahu to North Shore. We, um, there's 150,000 um, for Aloha Harvest to establish a food resiliency and emergency response hub in the district in an event of a um, disaster. Um, and then we also put in 260,000 for CIP needs for the Okinawan Center in Waikio renovation improvements. And then finally, 500,000 for the Wahiwa Center for Community Health for operating funds to serve the Lelehua Nililani Wailua School Complex to address growing mental health and behavioral health. So really stoked about that. Um, um, I have a couple events I'd like to invite you to. So I don't have a newsletter. Didn't get finalized because I'm waiting on headshots from folks. But I'm going to have two events um, that we're organizing next month. The first one is July 8th. We're going to have a Mililani Mauka cleanup. July 8th from 9 to 11 a.m. Meet at Mililani Park and Ride. We're going to go through Ukuvai Street, Makai Kai Street, Ain Makua Drive, and then Mahiula Parkway. Um, I think we're still short, maybe six volunteers. So any of you would like to come, you'll get a bento um, and a lot of good hugs and high fives. Um, if this is a partnership with HPD District here. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in response to a lot of the crime that's been happening, been talking a lot with um, law enforcement, but we on July 25th, and this will be in my newsletter once it's finalized, we'll email it out to you guys. Um, we are going to have a Reimagining public safety community talk story. And my keynote speaker um, will be HPD chief Joe Logan. He will be joined by his two deputy chiefs. Um, uh, and, I mean, um, deputy chief Keith Horikawa will be there. Community policing team for both district two and um, uh, Pearl City district will also be there. And we will also have the chief for the community and crime prevention branch for the attorney general's office. So we're going to talk about some kind of, you know, youth drugs, substance use, um, how to prevent online fraud, um, a lot of these scams that's been happening lately. Also talk about that. So it's really about community prevention and how the community can get involved in those efforts. So again, July 25th, um, Tuesday, 6 p.m. at the Mililani High School cafeteria doors open at 530. And then finally, um, since I didn't get to introduce bills, I introduced five resos and all of them passed and got adopted. And I'm stoked about that too. Two things I'm quickly working on. So I did meet with DTS on um, one of the resos was on raised um, crosswalks and traffic calming measures on Meheula Parkway. So I worked with them because um, Meheula Parkway um, has three times as many crashes as Cam Highway. And so, um, the DOT testified that they will provide the resources necessary for the design and installation of traffic calming measures. Um, and DTS would need to provide right of way because it's a city road. But city would like to study which areas and I guess what type of traffic calming measures to get folks to slow down because people are running the red light often. Um, the second one, oh, and then when I did meet with them, I did raise our connection to rail. Um, and unfortunately, they said there's no current plans right now to, um, to connect our bus service to the rail existing rail park and rides or the Wayava station. And I did raise it as a concern um, because it does it cuts off our commuters and the, you know for our district as well as North Shore. And so Chair Hazam, I think that's a wonderful idea to focus on the transit center. Finally, um, one of the area principles. Um, um, we worked on this um, rezo, but it's really um, contraceptive access. So the big box store that we have, Walmart, keeps um, basically contraceptives behind a locked glass case. So it makes it harder. It creates a barrier for folks who just want to practice safe sex, and it creates unintended pregnancies and such. So miraculously, I met with the online, the Walmart West Coast, I guess, government affairs person, and. So we're working towards that and hopefully, um, yeah, you know, they, I said, if you 
decide to support this and get this implemented here, uh, maybe you can come to Hawaii uh, <laughs> and celebrate this success. Um, finally, just thinking, oh, she left already, but uh, all the graduations, some of the area schools that Lauren and I overlap, we issued some joint certificates to all the graduating um, elementary students. So happy to have done that for the community. That's it for my report. I will send you the once we finalize the flyer for the public safety event, I'll send that to all. Okay. Oh, yes. I think Patsy Mink Park yes. is in your area. Yes. What the devil's going on down there with Vinic? Oh, the, with the Vinic. Oh, I don't the, know. In the dog park. The dog park area. Been all. Still, yeah, under investigation, as far as I know. And I know they closed um, some air portions too for, for, you know, kind of. Well, Lindsay I do know that there's some other cops, uh, some guy that, I don't know, I guess there's people that are taking care of the dog park mm -hmm. and wrote in and was talking about uh, using vinegar to kill the bees. And uh, so I don't know what, what the amount of weed was. I don't know anything, <laughs> okay? Except yeah. that what he, what he wrote in about was interesting in that he said that the city park maintenance crew has not been real active. That way. Mm -hmm. So that was the reason that the customers of the dog park were taking care of the area. I just check into that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. So, in addition to being with Grace Point and also with Four Scouts of America and Stanton Names, uh, this is our particular area on membership and recruitment. However, we're doing a cleanup. In this area, right on July 8th, right? The unit that was here that presented the flag, Troop 664, on a monthly basis on Sundays, probably the second, they do at that same time, 9 to 11. I'm sure you could recruit all of them along with the, the pack that meets right here. We can just talk with Stanton and we can push that through the other council to get more youth involved, all right? Um, I'm sure it's Stanton. Awesome, thank you. Representative? Hi, Steve Melendez here. Hi. I have a question. Inquiry for more information on you mentioned about the emergency emergency food. Yes. Tell me more about more about that. So this is spearheaded through Aloha Harvest, and I need to pull their GIA proposal. But from, from what I understand when we hit, we had, we had, when we met was they wanted to set up a, um, kind of establish an area where they can store food. And, but I don't really know the extent of the planning, but this is part of kind of the work that it'll help fund with the planning and then identifying a site here in central Oahu for that. Great, thank you. I, but I can follow up with you too. Um, yeah, I'm a, with Bill. Yeah. Thank you. As, uh, I'm a commissioner and I've had other chairs bring up the similar issues. And about a year or so ago, we also had a presentation from UH talking about a same subject and about how doing a co-op in the Wahiwa area. So that's why I'm curious about which, what this proposal has to say. Yeah, we have established, um, it's in the very early stages, so it could be a great collaboration. Great. Whatever you have, if you could be so kind to send it to our neighbor to Sister Hill to send it to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Trish. Thank you. Okay, moving on to approval of our April 18, 2020 board minutes. Board members, any comments or corrections you like? Seeing none, any objections? To adopting the minutes as within in the objections, any extensions. Seeing none, the minutes are adopted uh, by unanimous consent. Moving on to reports, uh, Central Regional Park. Nothing to report. Okay, education. Uh, Shelby's not here, Stephen. Uh, yes, thank you. I'll be commenting concerning um, Midlani Middle School 
I'm the ad education chair, and I'm also looking for someone to help support the uh, elementary school since Shelby is uh, no longer supporting the board at this time. Um, so I have this. Are you able to put this up in our drive? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, I'll share this then. Um, the write-up is Dear Family and Friends. At the top of this, we have the, the uh, staff from Middleani Middle School doing a great job there. I'm really pleased that now the middle school is on the regular school schedule. The um, 15 classroom building was finished here last, uh, some months ago. I'm now on the regular school schedule, which is great. Um, the narrative is that the 22, 23 school year was great making forever friends. Our HIP program, if you, if you know about the middle school, they have the high interest programs, which is about 33, pro actually 31 programs having to do with band, sports, uh, character counts, uh, video, et cetera. Really great programs are all free. They had over 700 students attend them this last year. Um, the PTSO fundraiser, uh, the last spring fundraiser was great, bringing in students, family, and, fac and faculty together. And then at the, if you go up on the Midlani uh, Middle School website, they do have summer fun. Uh, the write-up is for a uh, how to transition to becoming a blazer. Is for the students that are be going, coming into the, the middle school. That's for July 10th through 11th from 8 to 12. And then they have a cyber camp. I don't know if you're aware, but the Cyber uh, cyber Patriots. Cyber Patriots is the number one uh, cyber organization for youth in the, in the country. As a matter of fact, it also supports the new uh, cyber program at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. But we're here, we're so blessed to have a, and we have actually six active teams in Middleani Middle School for cyber camp. So they're having a cyber camp on July 24th, 28th from 8 till 12. If you have any questions, give the school a call. There are, there are staff there at 627-9000. Or you can go up on their website, um, middleanimiddle.k12.high.us. And uh, thank you. Any questions, education report? Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I worked with for years with uh, uh, Mr. Shroma, great guy. And, you know, you've probably seen uh, Principal Shannon Thomas Shroma. He grew up and was mentored by. Um, Mrs. Chung, and she mentored a lot of the VPs. And then after he was mentored, he went off to be a, a, a principal for an elementary school. Now he's back here. He's come home. So we have a great staff. Where we're so uh, fortunate to have such capable uh, leaders in our middle school here. And thank you. Thank you. Military and civil defense. Uh, no report. Parks and recreation. No report. Planning and zoning. Thank you. Patricia, I don't have anything. Alice, do you have anything on recognition of service or the transportation? Sorry, I was not sleeping. Um, on recognition and service awards, I talked to Steve about it because Shelby has started leading her board. And I don't know what the routine is, but I talked to Steve and he said he. Except something, but I wanted to know. Well, I come from the chair. Uh, we work to NA to get her a certificate. Right, that's that's it. what I'm I'm asking because I was hoping maybe it's tonight that she can get it. Yeah, well, Dylan will take care. So some Dylan makes it up. Okay, yeah. I think I asked you, Dylan. He didn't answer me. <laughs> you you have anything else, Alice? Everything else. Okay, so yeah, Shelby will not be joining us. So um, this is our last meeting for this particular board year. So our July meeting on July 18th will be our convening meeting for the new board year. Congratulations to all board members. So other than Shelby, we will all be returning to the board next year. 
So we are 64% here is in um, pending. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but congratulations really, and thank you for your service. Continued service to this community. Um, I really do appreciate it. Um, next, our next meeting will be held here Tuesday, July 18th at 7 p.m. Both in person and via WebEx. Um, there are no other announcements. Um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.